Hello everybody, this is the one and only Mr. LP, Stephen Sykes, host of and live and global media, sponsored by the Crossland Coleman Group and Cutting Edge Cartoons. And I'm here at the wonderful Maggot L. Walker Historical Site here located in the heart of Richmond, Virginia. And I have the lovely... Agina Rogers. Miss Rogers, thank you so very much. How are you doing today? I'm doing fine, thank you. Now, this is one of the most beautiful things I've ever seen, even though, you know, the quality and everything that's going on here. Tell us about this place. Well, where we are is Maggie L. Walker National Historic Site. It's part of the National Park System, one of over 400 parks in the National Park System. But this is one that's dedicated specifically to Maggie and Lena Walker, a, a pioneering African American woman of a powerhouse of business and community organization and activity and an advocate for civil rights in the early 20th century. One that not many people know about. It is shocking, uh, you know, as the saying goes, to make, you know, take those nickels and make them to dollars and yes. things of uh, the system. Mm -hmm. She was a very uh, forefront of a pioneer that actually blended community and community activism with corporate and the business world that people try to shut down even to this day. Yes, that's right. Mrs. Walker is an example of, of perseverance to the extreme, if I can say it that way. Uh, she never gave up, even when she had physical ailments that were going on later in her life, even when she had tragedies within her family, even when she had personal health problems. She would continue to aspire, to inspire people to come together as a community and to help as help women in particular, and black women even in more particular, to be able to expand their opportunities, expand their education, so that they can be a, an achieving, uh, contributing part of, of the society. And you know, being as a woman of color, so how do you feel growing up now, you being a very young woman, uh, and trying to grow Thanks up for that. And, 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 and <laughs> but, uh, being a young woman in today's society, how does it feel being empowered by someone like this woman in statue? Wow. It's incredible. It's, I have to admit, before I started working here at the National Site you know, uh, in 2010, I didn't know much about Maggie Walker myself. Uh, that, that she has these things that she did in, under Jim Crow segregation and to achieve what she did. And you gotta come out to the site to find all of those things out. It's a shameless plug there. Um, to come here and be able to share her story the way I have been able to do and the way my colleagues have is just incredible. There are days that I go into her home and I look at her picture there and I think, I just can't do it anymore. I just look at her picture and she's like, Really? Yeah, really. <laughs> <laughs> and I just pick myself up, and go just back keep on going. Keep on going. It's, it is amazing uh, for you know what goes on. And tomorrow, uh, we got a special ceremony that's going on here. Tell us a little bit about it and how did it come about? Okay. Well, every year the Park Service commemorates Maggie L. Walker's birthday, and so tomorrow would have been the 153rd and, uh, for, birthday for Mrs. Walker. She dies in 1934 uh, at age 70, but we make a point on July 15th to celebrate her birthday. And as part of that, this year, something very special, that there's going to be a dedicated uh, dedication of a memorial and a statue to Maggie Walker, sponsored by the city of Richmond. And that's a very beautiful thing. The interesting thing, and, and you would be surprised if someone as powerful and such a landmark crusading woman right. uh, for all what she's done, it was a controversy just to get it going. Yeah, it was a bit of controversy because it was a very public a process for getting it together. So, and when you have different people getting together, as you know, everyone has their opinions and, and their thoughts and their desires that they want to see in this memorial. <laughs> Everyone has their biases, everyone has their opinions, as we all know. You've been trained <laughs> As we all know, and that's the beauty of this process, uh, that we have uh, been able, the National Park Service has been able to be a part of it, 
and the community living here, community farm farm. Oh gosh, yes. And and I think by doing that, almost like the Constitution, you <laughs> get the, the best parts to keep going. You know, and it's one of the things that's hurtful. Um, you know, I'm not a native Virginian, but I've been here for pretty much half my life, and uh, most of it now, I should say. And it's interesting, you know, I've traveled a lot all over the world and come originally up north. You hear about Maggie Walker, okay? And, and I admit this all is just for my own interest, always trying to research, but you find it, I'm terribly shocked that there are people here who don't know about it. And this is her hometown. And a lot of the things that you have, in, especially in the story of Jackson Ward, you know, one of the Black Belts, Hollywood's areas in yeah. Virginia, you knew nothing about it. Well, it's almost always the rule of thumb that you know more about what's outside of your hometown than you do in your hometown. So, you know, it's just, sometimes it's, it pays just a vacation in your own backyard so that you know what's going on. And I think that's part of it. Um, and then people do know about Maggie Walker Governor's School, right, the, school the school that was named, but they didn't know about her home. Mm -hmm. Or they pass it by all the time and say, I'm going to stop by someday. And that someday has just been a long, been long, long, long time. time. And sometimes you need to have an appreciation because a lot of times people say, oh, I've been to that museum. Right. But you never know what has changed of data information. Sometimes records are quote unquote found. Right, right, um, right. Sometimes, uh, you know, more discovery, more funding, and sometimes it's just good to see when you're ready to not pay your tax bills, okay, mm -hmm. where is my money going to, now you can actually see it in right. things. And so, the city development within your own community is important. Right. We have been stewards of this site since 1978-79, mm -hmm. and it opened to the public in 1985. So, from 1985 right. till today, the site has changed. Much of tremendously restored her home first of all, and then restored the buildings that were surrounding it. So when you stand on the street corner of Second and Lee and look down towards Maggie Walker's house in the middle of the block, all of those homes have been restored to look like they did when Quality Row was Quality Row during mm -hmm. her lifetime. And then the private homes have been restored in the same way. And it's amazing when you have the Hippodrome, the you have all these other different things. Yeah. So now and it's just amazing that, you know, right there you can walk out your street and you go to Mac Walker, but then you can go see the Temptations or James Brown or all these different other acts that, you know, help push through a variety of things and, and yeah. you know, the segregation and the rules and stuff. Right. Richmond being a, one of the birthplaces of it all. Right. 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 Harlem in the South and Black Wall Street. Those are the names that were attached to Jackson Moore because of the pro progress, black progress that was here in place. And of course, over time, that comes and goes. And it had gotten to a place where um, it was just a, a shadow of what it had been. But people are working hard as a community Again, emphasizing Maggie Walker's view, you know, coming together as community, community. action. Right. Because you can't so always you can't always grant it. There needs to be help to funding and leadership. But I've always said this leadership starts at the top and at the bottom and in the middle. Right. You just don't just pick your lane and stick with it because everybody can't do everything. Right. It's not about it because I did it. Mm -hmm. It's just a community effort. Without the even if the government sponsored everything, right. without the community. We would not have all this. No, it would, this has been always a public-private partnership, and and everyone doing, as you said, what they can do in their part. So mm -hmm. that's that's what we do. What is what some of the recent changes uh, to the house that you see that done that's kind of significant that people need to see? Okay, well it depends on when, how long ago you came. Mm -hmm. um, we have all of the uh, we have all the main rooms restored. So when you do a full tour of the house, you can go through the first floor and the second floor and see the rooms as when her family was living here. And then we have a visitor center that you come to see. A brand new film just premiered this past October. And so it's a full experience that you can see when you come to the house. How can people get a chance, and for those who are not in the Richmond, Virginia area, and those around the world, how can they get a, a copy of that film? Well, it, right now uh, we are going to be producing it soon to okay. put it on DVD. I'm going to get a sneak, sneak preview of it okay. All right, yeah, on YouTube, on our channel. All right. The, the uh, Parks yeah. website is... Is it a, Mag a Maggie Walker site or the Parks? National Park Service website. Okay. So it's www.nps.gov slash ma 
WA. Okay. It has all kinds of information about Maggie Walker on there, and our, our uh, Facebook is an excellent uh, source. There's a lot of great information. There's a lot of great positive things to social media, and then that's one of those things to reach out to people. Uh, if someone want, want to say, you know, I want to donate to this site, do they contact you or go to that site? You know, specific yeah. versus. Yeah, I think we are um, going to start using social media to place that you can donate right there uh, through through the website, and we have of course donation boxes here at the site because we are a free free site. So there's also no excuse for it. It's not we like a. Very it, 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 there's a donation suggestion. Yes, donation suggestion. Bring bring a few dollars. You know, don't come down here. And it, it, it teaches a bit of a lesson to your children and family that you know. I'm not saying everything can't be free, but you know, contribute to your community. Right. Okay. Uh, what's the address for uh, for the site in this location? Okay. Our visitor center is located at 600 North 2nd Street. 600 North 2nd Street. Right. 600 North 2nd Street. So come on down. All right. Ma'am, thank you so very much for your time. I appreciate you. It's an honor and a glory. And thank you so very much. Again, this is Steven Sykes with Alive and Global Media, sponsored by the Cross Lane Coming Group. And also, uh, excuse me, Cutting Edge Cartoons, produced by Travala Studios. I thank you very kindly. Shout out to everybody. Make sure you come down here tomorrow at 10, at 10 o'clock for the statue dedication, 11 o'clock for the birthday celebration. All right, come on down. We appreciate it. We see you. Love you. Thank you all. Have a blessed day, everybody. Thank you. American History TV is in Richmond, Virginia. Right now we're driving through the Jackson Ward District, which is about a mile from the Capitol building. But it once was one of Richmond's historically African American neighborhoods. Up next, we'll take you to the home of Maggie Walker and share her real life rags to riches story. We are very privileged to be in a house that has been restored to the way it looked around the 1930s when Mrs. Walker had lived here for almost 30 years herself. And uh, the pieces that we're going to see are a reflection of Maggie Walker and her journey through her life to being uh, one of the best known women leaders of a fraternal organization and one of the first uh, women to m open a bank and the first African-American woman to be a bank president during the height of Jim Crow segregation. We're in the home of Maggie L. Walker, which has been restored by the National Park Service to the way it appeared during the last seven years of Maggie L. Walker's life from um, 1928 to 1934. However, Mrs. Walker lived in this home beginning in 1905 after purchasing the house in 1904. Uh, she took time to have the house renovated to take advantage of the most modern conveniences. And she would do these kind of changes throughout her time living here in the house. And the house becomes a way for her to show what could be done with determination, perseverance, education. If you applied yourself, if you worked hard, you could achieve the same kind of things that Maggie Walker did. So when we come into the house, uh, you come through the front foyer and into the parlor, the front room here. And uh, when you look around, you see a grand piano and fine chairs and uh, vases throughout the home, uh, furnishings that you might not have expected back in Mrs. Walker's day that belonged to an African-American woman. What she would do in this home is that she would show what could be done if you applied yourself. Uh, she wasn't born wealthy at all. Her mother was a laundress. Uh, who was raising Maggie and her, and her younger brother Johnny on her own after her stepfather was killed. And from that, Maggie Walker had to work hard alongside her mother uh, to help make ends meet. 
Her mother made point, though, to, to make sure that her daughter Maggie got a great education through the Richmond Colored Normal School, and she graduates from that school in 1883 and then goes on to become a teacher. Uh, but her career is cut short because of the laws of Virginia uh, that said that a woman had to be single in order to be a teacher. But when she married her husband, Armstead Walker, she had to leave the teaching profession and all that training that she had gotten. What she does is that she redirects all of her energies, all of the knowledge that she had gotten and all the, her, her knowledge of working with young children, her love of working with young children, to uh, direct that towards her organization, the Fraternal Order, the Independent Order of St. Luke. And it's from that that she begins to rise and becomes well known as a uh, figure in, uh, a leader in Richmond and also across the nation. Uh, through the Order of St. Luke, when Maggie Walker takes, it, uh, takes the head role in that as the right worthy Grand Secretary of the Independent Order of St. Luke, she begins to try to mold the organization so that it is one that benefits women, black women, because as a black woman herself, she knew exactly what it was like to be hemmed in by people who were uh, prejudiced against you because you were a woman and people who were prejudiced against you and tying you down because you were black. And that became her life's work, to work for the betterment and the opportunities for black women. But using the tools that were available to her, um, economic tools, buy black, create a black bank, create opportunities for um, working in a place that white society would not have allowed you to work and pull people together in unity. So we are very fortunate that we have uh, uh, items here that belong to Maggie Walker and her family. When you go throughout this home, you're, what you're seeing, about 90% of it is original to the family. From the grand piano that you see here that her grandchildren would play for special guests and visitors, to the, the vases and the um, statues. Another part of Mrs. Walker's story is about her, the obstacles and hardships that she faced throughout her life. Um, Mrs. Walker had many personal tragedies throughout, and one that I'd like to focus on here is in the story in the, told in the story of this rolling chair. Um, we reproduced this chair um, based off of the portrait that you see on the wall just above and behind it, where you see Mrs. Walker sitting, working very hard, uh, and you could hardly tell that in that photograph She's paralyzed from the waist down. Mrs. Walker suffered from consequences of diabetes, and in 1928, she completely lost the use of her legs. But that did not stop Maggie Walker from uh, continuing to work as hard as she ever did. She would, as you see in that portrait, be uh, writing her speeches, keeping a smile on her face, inspiring others to uh, do and work as hard as they ever had. When you see the chair, you see how she had it adapted uh, with the footrest there on the bottom and wheels and also handholds. So let's go into the next room across the way. Now Maggie Walker was one who inspired others, but there are times you need inspiration yourself. The room that we're coming to now is her library. And when she bought the home, she bought it from a physician who had added this section to the house. And he used it as his uh, office, his examining office. But Maggie Walker, over the years, converts it into a, a library, a place of study, a place of reflection, and a place of inspiration. So you, when you are looking in this room, it's very, very narrow. However, it tells a big story. Um, the books, several hundred volumes, of books original to Maggie Walker and another smaller bookcase over here. It shows how much she enjoyed reading and knew that what you could learn 
just by reading and having books all around you. If you look up a little further, the diplomas are there on the wall. The one with the blue ribbon is Mrs. Walker's diploma. And of course, it's before she got married, so it's Maggie Mitchell graduating from the Richmond Public schools, the Richmond Colored Normal School. But beside it is her son Russell's. She had two sons, Russell and another son, Melvin, who Russell graduates from the school as well, and Melvin does eventually also graduates from Shaw University. So she would have diplomas for the family all across the, the top as well as some of her, um, her recognition vases and trophies that people had given her over the years. Another thing that strikes people when they walk into this room are the hundreds, it seems, of photographs. These photographs show people that Mrs. Walker worked with uh, or who were part of the Independent Order of St. Luke. Uh, I'd like to look at this photograph on this poster here, 101 Prominent Colored People, and it shows in 1905, 101 leaders, black leaders, and Mrs. Walker is part of that group. So here she is, um, right beside Booker T. Washington, okay. only one of 10 women who are listed on this poster. And the poster was put out in 1905, the very same year that Maggie Walker moves into this home. So it shows you that she was already as early as that, being recognized for the work that she was doing in the community, uh, particularly because she started the St. Luke Penny Savings Bank in 1903, and thus becoming the first African American woman to be uh, who uh, president of a chartered bank. Um, but that wasn't the only thing she did through the Order of St. Luke. Uh, uh, again, writing, reading. It goes right forth into becoming the editor of the newspaper, the St. Luke Herald, which became the organ for the, news, the people in the organization to communicate with each other. So I like to think of her sitting at this desk. We have photographs of her sitting at the desk writing and um, reflecting, most likely, in this very, very room. Mrs. Walker would often have those folks gather and they would come here to visit with her. And the place that they could gather would be right in the dining room. We we're very fortunate that um, the house is, comes to the National Park Service through Mrs. Walker's family. Her daughter-in-law, Hattie, made a good point of preserving the home and uh, keeping things in place because she knew that this would be a, 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 sh a museum, should be a museum in honoring her mother-in-law. And then Hattie's daughter, Maggie Laura, then transfers the home to the National Park Service and, uh, in 1978, and then it becomes a national park, and we restored it, opening the a uh, house to the public in 1985. As we were working on restoring the home, we were able to speak with Mrs. Walker's grandchildren and get inside stories of how each of these rooms were used, what they remembered about being here in this home with their grandmother. So as we're here in the dining area, we see how formally it's laid out. And the grandchildren recall that they would come here for special occasions or holiday meals and how they could, could gather right in here. Uh, because the home was not only a show place, it was a family home. So let's go upstairs to Mrs. Walker's room. So as we come around, we'll see Mrs. Walker's suite of rooms on this side. And what she did and when she had the major renovations done in 1922 is that she also converted this area into a sitting room for herself and see a view of the, the bathroom there. Uh, once she was paralyzed and in a wheelchair, she would have had to uh, figure out a way to avoid all those stairs. So, because she would come in from the back of the house and there's an elevator that she had installed that would bring her upstairs and she'd come through the bathroom area, through the sitting area here, and into her own rooms. This room really reflects Mrs. Walker and all of her 
causes and interests and her passions. When you look around the room, you see on the walls, again, photographs. They're not just photographs of famous people. They're photographs of people who are very close to her, her four grandchildren. And they're photographs of her son, Russell, of her mother on the, the mantelpiece there. And one of the, my favorite images of Maggie Walker in her offices at the, the Order of St. Luke. As you look around the walls, there's something else that is reflected of Mrs. Walker, the, her deep faith. It is a way that she could keep going when times were rough and, and um, obstacles were coming from all sides. Mrs. Walker also had a, had a porch enclosed where she could go out and still be very close to her community because from that porch, from the front of the house, she could look out onto her, her beloved community of Jackson Ward. When she was the uh, grand matron of the juvenile department, a department that she had founded with the Order of St. Luke all the way back in 1895 before she even stepped up as the leader of the entire organization. She f started a, a, the organization's division of youth, uh, the juvenile division. When she was more confined to home and couldn't get out to see the juveniles parade, they rerouted the parade to come under her window so that she could still be a part. Maggie Walker um, it dies here in her home, December 15th, 1934, surrounded by her family. She's fallen into a, a diabetic coma. Her community pours out to warn Maggie Walker and to honor Maggie Walker. Uh, the streets out in front of the house are packed with people as they are coming out uh, to, to go to that funeral for Maggie Walker because of the impact she had on their lives for the, the symbol of, of determination and perseverance that she showed throughout for people as an example, not only here in Richmond, not only in Virginia, but throughout the United States. After her death, um, Maggie Walker's organization did as she asked them to do. Uh, one of her last words was to say, have hope, have faith, have courage, and carry on. And that's what they did do. Her uh, newspaper kept going on. The Independent Order of St. Luke kept going on until the uh, late 1980s. Uh, it, but the bank is the one that's the most incredible. Uh, the bank that she started in 1903 started as the St. Luke Penny Savings Bank, the bank that she guided to merge with two other black-owned banks during the Great Depression, continued to go on for a hundred years as an independent black-owned bank. When visitors leave this place, I would hope that the main thing they come out with is a feeling of inspiration. That's what I walk away with. Because if M Maggie Walker and her community, the people who are in this Jackson Ward community, if they can survive some of the things that were, were thrown at them in their time with less, uh, with fewer opportunities than I enjoy today, I can do it too.